Ladies and gentlemen, this is DVP World. You're watching another edition of Press Corner, where we round up the most important headlines of the week, and we'll have a riveting discussion with our fellow journalists, columnists, panelists, and experts from across the European Union. Now, we will be talking extensively about the European Parliament election, but first, let's introduce our guests right here. We have a really great lineup, starting with the ladies. Alexandra Karasinska, journalist, founder, and former editor-in-chief of Forbes Women Polska. Thank you for having me. And of course, we have Karolina Wojcicka, columnist of the Jenik Gazeta Pravna. And we have here with me Mr. Wukash Wojcicka, uh, sorry, Wojcicka, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Wukash. Uh, journalist, commentator, political analyst of uh, Dorzeche Weekly. And last but not least, our uh, favorite Adam Borowski, Commons International Relation Analyst. Thank you guys for being with us here on TVP World. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So have you guys voted yet? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet? Not yet, but we will probably, I am going to. Yes. All right. Same here, straight from the studio. The polling has just opened, right? So we are already seeing people kind of flooding into the polling stations. Of course, we're also going to be discussing the turnout rate later on, but we do have to also realize that it is still very early to kind of put a pin on whether or not we're going to see significant turnout. And of course, that's going to be very important going forward. And of course, as we mentioned, the first topic of the day will be the European Parliament election. And before we take a deep dive into this particular topic, let's take, first take a look at a report. 21 of the European Union's 27 member states are holding elections for the European Parliament this Sunday. Nearly 400 million Europeans are eligible to elect their representatives to Brussels. 720 MAPs will be chosen less than during the last elections due to the United Kingdom's exit from the bloc. 12 states will send a larger delegation to Brussels this year following a reallocation of additional seats based on population numbers. The elections for the European Parliament usually see lower turnout than national elections. This year's vote, however, has attracted more attention than usual largely over issues of immigration and environmental policy. Data from the Netherlands, which was first to hold the vote, shows a larger turnout than five years ago. The European election also serves as an important test ahead of national elections for political parties across the continent. And of course, today is the day where a lot of the countries are having their election. The polling station has just opened. So for you guys who are watching this live and haven't voted yet, please go do so. You can just turn on us uh, tvpworld.com and bring us with you. Meanwhile, let's take a look at this election. And can we first talk about just how important and crucial it is to participate in this uh, democratic process, starting with the ladies? So, uh, Alexandra. First of all, I would like to stress how important the moment for European Union is. We are uh, facing, as a uh, member states, as a union, uh, huge challenges ahead of us. So there are, I will name four of them, and mainly the war in Ukraine, Russian war in Ukraine, ongoing for two years already. Uh, secondly, climate change and change to renewable energy. Third, I would say uh, problems with economy and namely inflation, stubborn inflation, and also in general competitiveness of uh, European market comparing to China and, and US. And thirdly, I would say, uh, and of course climate change, yes, I, I, I mentioned uh, the energy, but also migration. This is the huge uh, dilemma and we don't have really you, united uh, policy or uh, common ground here. So this will be the four challenges ahead of the new parliament. Right. So uh, as uh, Alexandra has just mentioned, there is significant challenge facing the European bloc. And we've actually seen these topics, uh, these more pan-European topics, becoming a talking point even when it comes to uh, domestic discussions. So, uh, Carolina, do you think that this will result in a higher turnout as people are seeing that these are increasingly important topics? I think so. I mean, the European Parliament has always had this problem of uh, very low turnout. But last cycle, electoral cycle in 2019, we've already proven that uh, the turnout can be higher. And I think it's mostly because 
the citizens of the European Union, they see that actually uh, only collectively we can face some challenges that are becoming more and more global, like Alexandra said, climate change, also security issues. But with the COVID pandemic, uh, we've again proven that if we act together, we can secure the vaccines for the lower price, etc., etc. So there's a lot of issues that we can only face when we act together as the bloc. Uh, and with the war in Ukraine still um, taking place and with more security uh, issues on the border uh, with, with Russia and Belarus, I think people will realize how important it is to, to vote for their vision of the European Union and how they want it to proceed with all those, all those challenges. All right. And Ukash, do you have the same sentiment when it comes to this uh, topic? Similar. First of all, I would say that I don't like the word challenge because I think it's a new speak for problem. And in fact, the European Union has many problems and I, I would agree with uh, the description of those problems. And I would say that normally in Poland we had like 40%, about 40% turnout in the European elections. I think this time it might reach something just below 50%. Perhaps I'm mistaken, we'll see in the evening. But I think that people are really um, annoyed and uh, they are afraid of some issues. Like, for example, the Green Deal. All the polls show that the this, sole this uh, notion of Green Deal uh, make people angry, make people um, be afraid of what might come out of it. So they might, because of that, they might want to, to, to vote this time. All right. And um, Adam, challenges, problems, glass half empty, glass half full, how do you see this? Well, there are many challenges, of course. And I always repeat, always say that black swan events are crucial and they always are a factor to consider. Um, and we forget about the power of propaganda, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of people have their minds um, tainted, have their psychological makeup um, uh, distorted by propaganda. And unfortunately, it seems that this malaise has set in. So yes, voting is crucial. It is critical. But there is a lot of people that just, um, they don't care anymore, right, because of what's going on. So um, um, there is a lot of chaos, basically. And um, yes, we can talk about how important it is. But as we can tell by what's going on in the world, how integrated it is, um, there are things that can happen and they upturn everything, right? So um, yes, there are issues. It's important to focus on them. But we need to move forward. And that's why election, of course, this is, a, this is a crucial, right, for, for us to, to go forward. But we can't forget about, you know, the unexpected. Unfortunately, we're now in an era where things like this tend to happen. Um, and of course, we had it in the past with the pandemic, with the war and so on, right? So um, we need to look at this globally. That's right. crucial. Look at it globally indeed. And of course, as the hours come, we will see the turnout rate. And of course, we will be also observing the results of the outcome. Meanwhile, please stay tuned. We have more information coming up. And again, if you haven't voted yet, please go do so. It is not just a right to participate in these elections, but it's also a responsibility. Meanwhile, this uh, will conclude our coverage of the European Parliament election. And for now, let's turn into our next topic, the situation in the Polish Belarus Russian border. Now we have a video coming right up, so let's take a look. In the early hours of May 28th, a migrant attempting to illegally cross the Polish Belarusian border attacked a Polish soldier guarding the area, stabbing him. The soldier was given first aid on the site and was later transported to a military hospital in Warsaw, where he underwent three separate surgeries. The Polish armed forces announced his death on Thursday. This is the first Polish soldier to lose his life while defending the border of Belarus since the migrant crisis began in 2021. Following the attack, the Polish government announced the extension of the exclusion zone along the border. Opposition politicians criticized the strict rules of engagement restricting the use of firearms by Polish soldiers guarding the border. In an incident made public just a day before the soldiers passing, three Polish soldiers were arrested and investigated for firing warning shots at migrants, leading to further criticism. The Speaker of the Lower House of Parliament, Szymon Hołownia, expressed similar sentiment, 
saying soldiers should be allowed to use guns to defend themselves. So, of course, this is one of the bigger topics in Poland, as has happened in the past week. We actually saw a Polish soldier lost his life. And uh, a lot of people are looking this at, at this as a significant event that might escalate the situation in the Polish-Belarusian border. So I would like to kind of reverse our order here and start with the guys, especially Wukash, because you just mentioned earlier that uh, some people are finding it alarming when it comes to a particular situation. Would you consider this uh, current event one of those issues? Definitely, and I think that it might, in a way, influence the result of the, of the ongoing elections. But if we think about who is to blame for what unfortunately happened, I think that um, both sides of the political um, fight are to blame. Because the previous government had about two years, more than two years, to train soldiers who serve um, as an aid to police and border guard to fulfill uh, typically policing tasks, because at the border, uh, everyone has to fulfill typically policing tasks, not military tasks. And they did not do it. Um, there is also the question of the rules, of the regulations about using firearms. Uh, they could do it because they had the majority in the parliament and also the president, they did not do it. And the current government had over half a year to, to mend those issues, or at least to try to mend those issues. And they also have not done it. So I think both sides really are to blame for what uh, happened a couple of days ago. All right, and speaking of both sides, of course, we still also have to consider that there's another side that is on the other side of the border. So uh, Adam, can you help us understand whether or not this is uh, one of those black swan events you were talking about, or is the kind of Russian influence of the hybrid warfare kind of spreading into this part of the world? I actually wrote about hybrid warfare for Kiev Post not long ago, so it's uh, fascinating copying it, complex. But I would agree with the uh, previous uh, point that, you know, there is this contradiction in the law, basically, you know, whether they can shoot or not. I mean, this is going to create a lot of chaos because soldiers don't know what to do. Right. And this is just unacceptable, you know. They really need to know that they are secure and that they are not going to be punished for doing their job. So I think that's crucial. Uh, no, it's not the Black Swan event because uh, we are expecting this kind of you know, hybrid warfare. So this is not what I'm talking about. Um, so unfortunately, this is going to keep happening. The question is, you know, that the Belarus and others, of course, they see that there is chaos on our side with the laws. And they're going to say, OK, they, they have chaos. Let's use it to our advantage. And that's the problem. That's why it's in our best interest on every level to make sure this chaos is no longer there. You know, we can't just, this can't be just political wrangling. The stakes are too high. May I just add one thing to that? Um, we know from the reports from the border that uh, the people attacking Polish, Polish border guard or Polish soldiers, they are trained and taught uh, what is happening on the Polish side. So for example, they are taught uh, what Polish soldiers can do and what they mustn't do. So they know what they themselves can do towards Polish border guard or soldiers. This is very, very dangerous. So this is not an accident. This is yeah, not, they are trained. Definitely. So I would say there are two layers. I agree with what you just said, but we can analyze these tragic events on two like, levels. First of all, what we can learn from it uh, as a state and as our government or Ministry of Defense, what you've mentioned is that definitely there is a tension, there is a chaos between two services. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, Coast Guard, the, the, the Border Guard, and uh, the military, the army, they are, uh, the, the, their um, cooperation is not clear. Obviously, uh, also military, uh, the army is not trained properly to deal with such situations. They, they are not well equipped to deal with it. So there is one, one side of this. And of, of course, this is uh, uh, something we can uh, fix uh, very quickly. But uh, on the other level, you mentioned the hybrid war. And this is something serious and we really, really should learn from it. Uh, because uh, we will be seeing this kind of tragic events in the future. There are, I've checked it yesterday on the website, there are 380 events on the Polish-Belarusian-Russia border di in, only in the last week. Yes. So these events will happen 
this is part of the hybrid war and we uh, we really as a society should uh, be more aware of it uh, the whole political class the we are as media also should be responsible about covering this event because mm -hmm. what the disinformation is uh, doing the russian dis disinformation is like trying to play on social emotions so influence people's uh, agenda and also get all those emotions uh, high. And the second uh, goal of the disinformation and such hybrid war is to turn down and destroy authorities. So the government, politicians, army, etc. So people do not trust their authorities. And we really, really have to be very careful. And when I see the, uh, some uh, what should be done, really, we should really educate people, we should in be more informed, and uh, the society must be resilient to this kind of situations. Can I just add here that, uh, you know, of course it's tragic what's happening on the border. You know, people are dying, yes, and refugees and migrants. And there are people, of course, who voice their concerns. Mm -hmm. But we need to be careful because the other side can use this, right. can weaponize these people, mm -hmm. you know. They might be uh, acting in good faith, but the other side, of Belarus, Russia, and so on, they might use it, use these people, weaponize them. And we need to be aware of that. Right. It does seem like if we jump into a knee-jerk emotional reaction, it was will we'll yeah. kind of uh, foster a further divide and polarization, which gives space for these Russian disinformation to come in and muddy the waters. So I was actually wanting to address, uh, Carolina, if you can tell us uh, how have the international media been covering this? And do you think the way that is being done currently is productive discussion when it comes to covering the event? Or do you think that this might, again, stir up some emotions? I don't think the debate right now is very productive because what we need right now is a very comprehensive uh, strategy towards migration uh, and towards this hybrid war that is happening on our border. Um, and we don't have that. We haven't had that with the law and justice government and we don't have that with, with a civic coalition. Uh, they are sort of reacting to, to events that have already happened. Uh, and, you know, I'm very much afraid that this whole situation, those two tragic events, uh, death of a Polish soldier and uh, those warning shootings, uh, will lead to more brutalization. That's something that we already see, uh, especially on the internet, on Twitter and other social media, uh, that people are, are demanding uh, soldiers to shoot more. But the question is, where is it going to lead us? because obviously uh, Belarus and Russia will not stop. They actually want us to react in a very brutal way and treat migrants in a very unhumane way because that's the, uh, that's the argument for them. Well, look, Europe isn't very humanitarian, as you thought. And that's also a very important thing for us because we support Ukraine. And Ukraine right now, uh, just next week, there will be a conference in Switzerland about a uh, peace plan. And, and Ukraine wants to sort of unite uh, the global south um, behind Ukrainian cause. Um, well, when the global south sees what's happening on our border and how we treat migrants with uh, weapons, with shooting and so on, uh, they will just, you know, disconnect with us even more. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a huge issue and we should look thoroughly uh, with both uh, intent security uh, in our minds and humanitarian aspects of that. That's, and that's very complex to navigate and difficult, but uh, we have to deal with that somehow. Right. Well, I, I would dare to, to disagree just a little bit, because in fact, we are at war. This is, of course, a very specific war. It's not a hot war, luckily, but it's a hybrid war. And I think people who are, as you uh, rightly said, weaponized, um, they are there because they chose to be there. They are weaponized, they are used by the Belarusian government and Russian government, that's true, but they chose to be there. Yeah. So they have, because they are ready to kill, and we know that now, they are ready to kill, and they have to know that we are ready to kill in response to, this is my opinion. I mean, they calculate uh, whether it is uh, good for them to go there, to try to, f to, to, to uh, cross the border illegally, and they have to take into account that they might be right. just shot. Like there's a risk assessment there and whether or not they will conduct these actions, and maybe changing the logistics on the ground might give them something else to consider. Uh, uh, Alexandra, because I, yeah, I know you've I, been I wanting would, to... I wouldn't agree with that because, you know, uh, with the migration problem, it's much more difficult than people should be responsible and not migrate from, uh, I don't know, zone conflicts or 
or uh, taking their children to safety. But uh, the problem with the uh, propaganda and the disinformation and the hybrid war is for me that it's also turning us, Poles, against each other. And I've seen it on the internet. Mostly these trends are, are like taking place on the internet, on social platforms. And we see that there is this polarization, as you mentioned, going on, very high emotions. I've seen uh, like total uh, increase of vulgarity and, uh, and uh, vocal uh, um, insults in the internet against like uh, people who try to save uh, migrants and also tr people who uh, are afraid of uh, you know um, that soldiers and our military could get hurt and they try to fight and, and they fight each other whereas we should be united and have a as you mentioned a plan to deal with the hybrid war, not turn against each other. This is actually the result of hybrid, hybrid war. And when we talk about uh, the propaganda, the Russian and Belarusian propaganda, uh, well, we're not doing anything to combat this propaganda at home, in the Middle East or in Africa. So maybe we should also think about how to reach those societies, those vulnerable societies for to propaganda, because if they get news from Russia and Belarus, they will just believe it. And I personally talked to many migrants in Lebanon for example, Syrian people, etc. And they just believe that this route is very safe for them because when you have the sea route and then you think, oh, I'm going to take a plane to, to Russia or to Belarus and then I'm going to just cross the border. It seems so easy and they have no clue how it actually looks. I was probably to some of them, I was the first person who explained that, well, the border isn't as you, as you imagine it to be. So we should do something about that in the, ho uh, the home countries, uh, in the Middle East and in Africa. That's a very good point, very important one. Yeah, you just mentioned... Uh, just wanna... Yeah, please, okay. please do. Um, yeah, the previous point here that, you know, there is division. <coughs> of course there is, but I don't think it's uh, realistic, unfortunately, to expect that we're going to agree on every issue. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. We are in eco chambers now, and uh, we're just going to have to deal with it. We're just going to have to accept it. I don't think it's possible at this point to expect that people are going to be able to have dialogue. Unfortunately, some people are unable to do that, and that's uh, because of the polarization over the years, and I don't think that's going to change. And we're going to have to deal with this somehow. Right. Which, a very pessimistic look right well, there. <laughs> well, when you look at, you know, what's going on, it's just talk to people, right, from different perspectives. And I do that a lot. Yeah, we do see um, a lot of, you, like, you, don't, you can't get up. through to them. Well, that's realistic. But I think if we had a clear rules for the soldiers, for the border guard, if we had some proposals on how to change our regulations, this might help. Of course, it yeah. will not heal the, the, the divisions uh, entirely, yeah, but it would help, course, definitely. Uh, the laws, that's a different story, of course. Just one, okay. one uh, comment. I don't uh, apply, I, I wouldn't myself agree with you that this is the world we live in. Of course it is, but this is kind of a cynical view. What I expect is, because of the platforms, I actually teach on university, my students, journalists, about the influence of platforms on democracy mm -hmm. and media and how it destroys our democracy, what you just said. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is something I do not agree with and we should change it and we are changing it. Actually, uh, uh, on Impact Conference, uh, Radek Sikorski told the algorithms should be changed. If they're toxic, they could be banned. And he had in mind he didn't mention Facebook or Google or Twitter or any other yeah, American I, or if Chinese. I might add here, uh, <coughs> for example, they could be forced to change. So, so we should really not, uh, you know, say, okay, this is the world we're living. We're living Fair in enough. echo Fair chambers. Uh, but doesn't banning some voices add to the polarization by creating further echo chambers? Sorry, I uh, just wanted to respond. Yes, uh, you are of course correct. But look at Tucker Carlson, right? He spouts total nonsense, and he even says so, right? He said that denazification, that's total nonsense. Yet he has a lot, a, a huge Impact. platform, right? So yes, we can change it, but then you have someone like him, who is basically, we could say, well, manipulated, and that's putting it mildly. Uh, and he spouts this no nonsense. So well, how do you deal with that, right? Because you can't shut him down, because then you're going to turn him into a digital martyr, and that's just going right. to galvanize his supporters. So yes, of course, we need to address it. But uh, can we really turn this around? That's another story.
right? I hope so. I would say that I'm, uh, I think that uh, freedom of speech is of the utmost importance here. Mm. Right, and you also mentioned something uh, along the lines of deterrence through, through strength, and that is a lot of kind of strategy that people are pursuing right now. I would like to echo Carolina's sentiment that maybe there's also, uh, knowledge is also power. It probably doesn't have to be just with uh, guns, firearms, but also equipping the general population as well as the migrants with the knowledge might be able to also have the power of deterrence. So this is a very riveting discussion. I would love to go more into it, but we do have to reach our next topic. And for this one, we are turning our attention to Ukraine. Now, uh, Ukrainian president has met his French counterpart and uh, Macron has promised him Mirage fighter jets along with various others. Let's take a look at a report and we'll have a discussion at the end of it. The sky over Ukraine will soon be protected not by one, but by two different types of Western fighter jets. The F-16 aircraft, pledged by Belgium, the Netherlands and Norway, may soon be joined by French-made fighters with comparable capabilities. In concrete terms, tomorrow we'll be launching a new cooperation program and announcing the transfer of Mirage 2000-5 fighter jets from France, which will enable Ukraine to protect its soil and airspace. Starting tomorrow, we'll be launching a pilot training program, followed by the transfer of these aircraft. At one point, the French Air Force operated 315 Mirage 2000 aircraft in total, but now most have been retired and replaced by more modern Rafale jets. As they are decommissioned, dozens can be donated to Ukraine with the possible addition of some already retired aircraft. The provision of the Mirage jets is just one in a long line of recent pledges of military aid for Ukraine. Following a significant decrease in ammunition and equipment provision, Western countries rushed to provide Kyiv with more means of defending its territory. And as we have seen, uh, the Mirage jets will be going into Ukraine, and that's on the heels of also F-16 fighter jets being promised to the country too. So how is that going to change the frontline situation? Of course, it's a way to be seen, but at least the will is there. And can you guys help us understand uh, the current change of stance when it comes to helping Ukraine, especially the green lighting of using this equipment on Russian soil? Uh, let's start with Adam. Well, uh, it's a positive change, of mm -hmm. course, um, you know, but there is still this underlying issue right. of, you know, Ukrainians are allowed to strike Russia, but just near the border. So um, still, you know, Russia has uh, more, let's say, not impunity, but they can still do more, essentially, than Ukraine. And I find it interesting and perplexing at the same time that, you know, <coughs> Ukrainians, of course, are given more weapons, more planes. But at the same time, they are given these ridiculous rest restrictions, right? Because yes, now they can strike, but you can't strike further than that. Uh, so there is a lot of contradiction. You said that there is this nuclear threat, but apparently there is no nuclear threat. You know, politicians are contradicting themselves. Right. If there is no nuclear threat, then why can't you allow Ukraine to strike Russia no more? Oh, because of World War III. Well, then you are contradicting yourself. Right. This makes no sense. So, of course, it's very, very good, right, that we have more weapons, more planes. But even, you know, training the flight planes, right, it takes time. Um, so, yes, it's great, but these rules and regulations, often contradictory, it kind of dampens the enthusiasm, mm -hmm. right? Because Russia gets emboldened when they see it. So, um, yeah, that's, um, you know, it's, as I always say, it's a pro profoundly perplexing situation. That right. makes no sense when you look at it. There is progress, but the question is, is this enough? Right, and like you mentioned, there's a lot of mixed messages going on. A lot of here. mixed messages, and you might say, well, maybe that's the tactic, maybe that's the idea to confuse Russia, right? But it doesn't seem so. It just seems to be chaotic, and uh, unfortunately, that's not the way to, you know, to go. You know, just flag waving, that's not enough. You know, there has to be concrete action and it has to be coordinated and unpredictable as well, I'd say. Because if you announce every intention to the other side, where does that leave you, right? Mm. That's a very good point. So just to prove that we here at TVP World ask the real hard questions, and Mr. Hukash, can you help us understand why there is such kind of confusing narratives and do you think it has anything to do with the domestic political consumption? Yes, of course. I think that um, uh, President Macron has been going along his own agenda, which is first to create 
uh, an impression that there is a need to further unite the European Union along the security lines and second to sell as much of his French military equipment as possible. And I also happen not to agree uh, with the previous point that it's a good point. I think it's very dangerous. If we take a look at the map, uh, we are the first mm. possible uh, object of uh, uh, mm. a hypothetical revenge strike of Russia. It's yeah, very thanks. safe to do such things if you are in, in, in The Hague or if you are in Paris, mm. but it's not really very safe if you are in Warsaw or in Zeshuv. So I think uh, the first and the most important point of, of the Polish government should be to avoid as much as possible to mm. engage Poland into a hot war. I would just step back a little bit to your question why we are in the, uh, the France is uh, uh, giving Mirage to Ukrainians. And I, I would uh, agree that this is a very good, uh, good situation, a good uh, act, but maybe a little bit too late even. Uh, the, I listened to military experts from NATO, from Great Britain, and the analyst uh, point that we are actually in a very, very dangerous phase of this war, dangerous for Ukraine, dangerous for the West. Mm -hmm. And uh, why? Uh, because for the last two years, Ukrainian army, Ukrainian uh, air force managed a miracle, actually uh, uh, something that is uh, widely respected, to keep away from the front line a Russian air force. And right now we are at the point that the, 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 the border, the, the front line is very widespread. The Ukrainian army is like spread very thin and the Russians are really pushing forward and gaining ground and they are attacking the second largest city which is Kharkiv and uh, what what everybody is afraid that the Ukraine uh, the Russians will gain also the the possibility to, to fly near the border and bomb precisely and cause damage so that they later the infantry can go further into the ground and really really uh, this might be the beginning of the summer offensive. So the, the mirages are, uh, and other um, air defense is actually crucial. Uh, the, the question is if, uh, if it's not too late, because first of all, the pilots has to be trained, then the, the, the weapons, the, the mirages and the other um, equipment has to be integrated into the army. It takes time. So we really, like experts say, there are fix a few weeks, few months forwards that are very, very dangerous for Ukraine. I don't know if you agree. Um, I actually disagree with Lukas uh, because I believe that we should do everything in po on our power to support Ukraine. Um, because everything is a matter of perception. A few years ago, in the beginning of the war, uh, it was a taboo to send fighter jets or to send tanks, etc., etc. And then it changes. We change our minds, in, in mostly in Western Europe and the United States, uh, and we send those things to Ukraine, and they turn out to be invaluable for for Ukrainian, uh, for Ukrainians. And as we see. Uh, it's important to listen to what Vladimir Putin says. And recently he said that he's playing basically a long game in Ukraine. He wants to outlive our efforts and our ambitions and, and interest in this war. And just, you know, slowly but steadily get to the point uh, where he wins the war. And we just cannot accept that. We should do everything in our power. We should help Ukraine to avoid war at home. So I believe that the situation is very much different. Yeah, we should go there and help. And we shouldn't rule out the, the, the proposition of President Macron, even if he's doing that for, for his own agenda and for his own political gains. Uh, we shouldn't rule out sending our uh, troops to train Ukrainians in inside of Ukraine because, well, the war has been ongoing for for uh, almost three years. So and there is no end in sight. Uh, so we need to sort of step up our game and adapt to the changing situation on the ground, which is not perfect because what we see in Kharkiv, what we see uh, in Donetsk, it's not uh, positive, you know, for, for, for Europe. I would just like to point out that sending Polish troops into Ukraine would be extremely unpopular in Poland. There yeah. is very, very little ex acceptance for that uh, uh, showing in the polls. And by the way, um, yeah, we need to remember, you know, I watch uh, Russian shows. Um, 
<coughs> and they did point out, uh, you mentioned Jeshuv, that, you know, given our history as Poles, we were betrayed, of course, by the West in the past, and one of their guests said that, you know, they're going to do it again. The West is going to betray us. I'm just saying what he said, right? Yeah, yeah. And even if we strike, let's say, nuclear strikes somewhere in Poland, the U.S. is not going to do anything. They're not going to jeopardize the security for Poland. Of course, that's what Siri Karaganov is saying. Uh, that could, yeah, could so, be Russian rhetoric. Yes, it's always a possibility. Right. Um, you know, we can't discount anything. I agree that, you know, this is not like, it's not just flag waving, right? But sure. at the same time, we can't do just nothing. Exactly. That's, there's that's there's the a balance there to be struck, right? We yeah. can't just like ignore everything they say, but at the same time, we can also fall into the saber rattling. And I think this discussion also shows how nuanced and how diverse the opinion on this is. I think we are all in agreement here that we want Ukraine to thrive. We want Ukraine to be able to deter Russia. But whether or not this move is further escalation or should we actually help Ukraine becoming the shield to defend the rest of the Western world is the topic at hand here. And I will have to discuss further going forward. Thank you guys so much for this input and again this is a very nuanced complex situation so really appreciate all the opinions coming in and of course you guys at home can make your own judgment and now we will be moving to our last topic the situation in Gaza is still a very much of power powder keg so let's take a look at the video and we will be discussing that going forward Israeli forces raided Nusayrat camp in central Gaza on Saturday, attacking two locations where hostages were being held. Following eight months of captivity, Israeli forces freed four hostages. Noah Argamani, age 26, who was kidnapped from the Nova Festival massacre site, along with her boyfriend, Avinatan Or, who remains in captivity. Andrei Kozlov, age 27, abducted from the Nova Festival on October 7th as well. Almog Meirian, age 21, also abducted from the same festival. Shlomi Ziv, aged 41, who was working at the Nova Festival, helping his cousin Aviv Eliyahu, who was killed by Hamas fighters during the attack. The raid was difficult as the hostages were held in two separate locations in a densely populated area. Israeli forces have not previously operated in the neighborhood, with Hamas fighters having undisputed control over the area. During the operation, one Israeli policeman from the Yamam hostage rescue unit sustained heavy wounds and died hours later in a hospital. Following the raid, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated his stance of trying to rescue hostages from military means and rejecting a deal with Hamas. Israel just carried out a remarkable rescue operation of four hostages held by Hamas. This uh, operation required ingenuity and courage of the highest degree. And our soldiers performed in an unmatchable way. We're committed to getting the release of all the hostages. And we expect Hamas to release them all. But if they don't, we'll do whatever it takes to get them all back home. The raid caused significant casualties. Israel claims about 90 people were killed on the Palestinian side, with Hamas giving a figure of 210, claiming most were civilians. So as you guys have seen, there's a logical through line through all these topics here. This is also both very nuanced and very complex, but my producer tell me we have the best guess right now. So it's high time we dive into this topic. Now I want to break this down into a more international perspective, a domestic one, one with involving the ID, IDF, one involving Hamas. So if any one of these topics strikes your expertise, please feel free to speak up. Meanwhile, the two biggest topic right here, of course, is the ceasefire deal proposed by US President Joe Biden, as well as the hostage rescue that have just taken place. Now, do you guys think that this hostage rescue situation is going to embolden IDF to pursue their military movement and, and do you think that internationally that would give Netanyahu some breathing room when it comes to his personal reputation? I believe so. I believe this, that this is a huge success of IDF and uh, it gives uh, Netanyahu the advantage because for the last three months the operation in Gaza was frankly unsuccessful in the term of two goals they, uh, they have and First goal was to rescue the, uh, the hostages. Secondly, was to get rid of Hamas uh, leadership. And these goals were not uh, achieved during this uh, th three months. So yes, uh, obviously there is a huge pressure uh, internationally and from US 
to uh, to end the operation or, or to get to the ceasefire moment and start some negotiation and um, exchange of hostages. But uh, the problem is with Netanyahu government. It's a it's a war cabinet. It's uh, consisted of different parties, also opposition parties, and it's obvious from the uh, results of the polls that if there was a ceasefire, there would be a. Uh, election, uh, early elections, and Netanyahu would lose. So he's not really interested in um, ending the situation right now. And uh, you mentioned uh, the President Biden announcement that there is uh, on the table some kind of uh, agreement to ceasefire. Obviously, it was uh, very unpopular in, uh, on the side of Israeli government. and. Also, the Hamas leaders said that this is not something they would accept. So basically, we are still uh, in a crunch, some kind of uh, um, um, hold up right now. And uh, from what I'm hearing from Israel, uh, the situation is also in um, very um, difficult internally. The society is polarized uh, dramatically. There is a lot of. Uh, the criticism inside the society that uh, the operation should stop, the, the, the government is not doing well. Uh, I even found uh, information yesterday that Benny Gantz, who is the leader of the, one of the op opposition parties, he was supposed to step down today or yesterday, but because of the hostage situation and the success, he didn't, he called off the conference. So there is uh, a tension and Definitely, there might be a reshuffle in the political scene in Israel in the next couple of weeks. Right, and as we can see in some of our reports over here, the like Guardian, for example, there's even there's actually highlights on the fact that Israeli uh, rescuing hostages also come at the cost of 93 Palestinians. Carolina, can you help us understand like how the coverage of the situation will be going forward? Do you think the international uh, media coverage or the international community will be focused more on the situation, the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, or do you think they will see this as a success? Uh, they will not see this as a success because those are those, those people that were rescued. It's only four of them, and there's still 70 to 80 uh, hostages in the Gaza Strip that are uh, alive, probably alive. Uh, so the number of the hostages is not very high, and you know. If you sacrifice the number here in, in Guardian is actually lower than uh, than it turned out in reality because people killed in, in the attack in Nusrat, uh, it's probably above uh, 200. Obviously, those are the numbers provided by, by the health ministry in, in Gaza. Uh, however, the question here is, can you really sacrifice over 200 people for the sake of four? And um, as, as you mentioned before, as ceasefire, there, there were many plans for ceasefire provided by Egypt, by the Americans, um, all of them turned uh, down by, by Israel, by Netanyahu, who wants a forever war. Uh, but the ceasefire that we had in November uh, that lasted for about uh, a week, uh, it turned out to be the most productive um, way to release the hostages. Uh, and in, in November, we had about 100 of them uh, being released from, from Gaza. So uh, with all that uh, we know, uh, I believe that the international media and the international society would be very much focused on the situation in Gaza, on the situation of the Palestinians, uh, because it's basically a bloodbath what's happening there. And I believe that right now nobody uh, is, is seeing things other than knowing that uh, Netanyahu wants to just stay in power. And that's even Israelis. There was a moment of, uh, of cheerful uh, celebration yesterday on the streets of Tel Aviv and other cities in Israel, uh, but that was short-lived mm. because people eventually will, will realize that it's just for hostages and there's many more to, to rescue uh, in Gaza. Uh, and there were protests yesterday as well, uh, like every week uh, people People were, were going out on the streets to protest Israeli government. Uh, so it might be seen as, as a short-lived success of Netanyahu, who once again proved to, uh, to manipulate the public and, and organize this, this operation in Gaza as sort of a PR stunt, actually. Mm. Uh, but eventually we'll focus on Gaza. But what, what does he need it for? First of all, to um, prove to his domestic 
public opinion mm -hmm. that he's doing something about the hostages and right. second because of the US public opinion which is the most important it's not done for international public opinion it's not important for Israel or for Netanyahu and there is still the question of the of the goal the final goal the question that was actually asked by uh, Mr Sikorsky in his exposé mm -hmm. what is the final goal of this yeah. how are they going, I mean, the Israelis are going to deal with the Palestinian population in the Gaza Strip? And this question has not been answered yet. Yeah, definitely. So a lot of question mark is still up in the air. And, and unfortunately, that, we are reaching an end of purpose. our program. Thank you guys so much for this really riveting discussion. And as I have been telling you, I guess we should need more time for this. But unfortunately, we are running out of time. Thank you guys for joining us. Really appreciate this morning. And for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TVP World.